Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm pleased to have you with us today for our podcast. I'm delighted to have Dr. Karen Ward with us. Karen Ward is a communicator, myth maker, and bridging activator as an academic with a master's and PhD in counseling and counseling psychotherapy and spirituality. With her husband, John Cantwell, Karen teaches and runs a clinic and school of Celtic shamanism and holistic living called Shri introducing energy awareness through nature and self-soul work. As a shamanic practitioner, supervisor, and teacher trained in the Celtic lineage and Druidic tr traditions, Karen founded and runs Moonmana Women's Celtic Circles, offering rites of passage ceremonies and online courses. Her television work includes energy therapist on the BBC's Last Resort and holistic therapy presenter from the RTE's Health Squad. She is author of the annual Moon Menage Diary Journal, which highlights the deep connection of women's monthly cycles with the moon. She is also writer of the innovative book, Change a Little to Change a Lot, and is a regular contributor to Naturally Good Health magazine, and the brainstorm section of the RTE website. Karen co-rediscovered the Bridget's Way Celtic pilgrimage, and she is guided in all she does by this quintessential feisty Irish goddess, of course, known as Bridget. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Dr. Karen, for being with me today. You know, I'm in the East Coast in North America, and you're in Ireland, and we're five hours apart, but we come together today on Zoom, and. I first heard of your Celtic shamanism work only a few weeks ago, actually, through my friend Elaine Nikirda. Um, and she's also been on this podcast. So thank you so much for taking your time out today out of your Irish summer to come join us. Um, I would love it if you could tell us more about what drew you to your work in Celtic and Irish spirituality, as well as shamanism. Oh, it's an honor to be here, Amy. I'm delighted. Um, and in truth, I have to go way back many moons ago. I was the child who played with the fairies at the bottom of her granny's garden and thought this was completely normal and that everybody did this until I got a rude awakening in school and realized, oh, this isn't what everybody else has experienced. So again, like many sensitive, intuitive, empathetic children, I learned how to how to coast and flow with the ebbs of my I suppose you could call it my gift but I didn't know it at that stage but I knew who I could talk to about it and I knew when to say nothing mm. and it was really through holistic therapies I would happily say that yoga has saved my life at least three times that I'm aware of possibly more and I ended up as many young Irish people did I, I was living in London it was very fast paced it was very exciting but extremely stressful and I knew something had to change and it was a yoga class and that was my in to holistic therapies so with the yoga with the aromatherapy massage I was learning about the body the physical therapies and this led on to me studying counseling psychotherapy. So I was bringing the mind in. But then to Reiki, I began to bring in the energetic. However, it was when I laugh and say, when I discovered shamanism, and shamanism discovered me, I realized this was the umbrella term that linked everything I did, everything I stood for, my love of dance, my love of crafting, my love of nature, it all sat under this one umbrella term. Yeah. But I was introduced to shamanism, interestingly enough, with Alberto Valaldo. So he's the Cuban American chap who did extensive work in Peru. And perhaps some of the your Celtic feminine women would maybe have studied or would be familiar with them. Lovely, lovely chap. But I began to ask, well, where's the Irish shamanism? Where's our Celtic tradition? So I began to look into Druidism. I began to look into what was in our land, what was literally seeping up out of the stones, 
flowing down from the sky. And that was my introduction. And as it transpired at that stage, I was married to a wonderful man, John, and he had a completely different background. But we came to this together and within minutes, things were beginning to click and we were remembering the old ways. So I'm very honored to walk this path with my husband. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah, it's that in, in that remembering that's so important and re-embracing a, a heritage that is kind of uh, buried for a little while, you know, I think in history. Um, so, uh, and, and speaking of your husband, John, I'm, I'm currently so pleased to be part of your introduction to Celtic Shamanism course that you and your partner, John uh, Cantwell, are teaching through Sleon Cree. Um, and so how did this work start uh, for you and John? Well, what was interesting was, Amy, we, we, Alberto Villaldo came to Ireland for one course of his um, Four Winds Healing Light Body School. And there were 90 people on that course, and at least 45, 50 of them were Irish. And I regarded myself as the holistic therapist in our family. And here was John going, I want to do this too. But we're both teachers. And within, I say, hours of this wonderful teaching, others were saying to us, oh, I missed that bit. Karen, can you explain that? John, could you demonstrate that again? So we found ourselves naturally falling into a teaching role within that. And then, of course, as we began to research with the ancient texts, journey ourselves, and springboard from those teachings, others began to say, oh, I'd love to do that too. So it was, it was a natural segue in. It seemed like all of our skill set, everything in our life experience up to that, coalesced into us teaching this wonderful sacred path. Oh, that's so beautiful. Uh, you mentioned some uh, ancient texts. What are some of those ancient texts, if I may ask? Yeah, so um, one of them is the Lar Gavala Neheran. So it's called the Book of Invasions, which isn't a great term, but it basically starts with the Tua de Danon, the tribe of Mother Earth in Irish Gaelic, and then the Fomorians, and then there were the Milesians. And the Milesians came up from North Spain, they were the Celts. So it charts who was there. Kessler and Fionton McBoat now were the, were the Adam and Eve, if you like, of Ireland. And it said that Kessler came up from Egypt, that there's a good chance that it goes back to the flood, Noah's Ark. It said that she's possibly his granddaughter. Um, so the Book of Invasions meant those tribes coming into Ireland and how they interacted. Another one is the Banshinkinus, and that's the lore of women. So I love that one, particularly mm. with my Moon Manal work. But equally, you could go to the Book of Kells, of course, was written by the monks. Um, Geraldus was um, a gifted writer. He was a Roman who came over to, to Britain, as we know it today. And the Romans never invaded Ireland, but they certainly visited. So he wrote about what he found within the tradition. So th these would be the ancient texts. But keep in mind now that the, the old ways would very much have been an oral tradition. So that when these stories and myths and legends were written down, there would have been a gap. And there, some of them have a, a patriarchal slant on them. Mm. Um, so we have to, we can't take them as fact. We work with the myths, the legends, but this is where the working with the energy comes in. So there's a sense of that feels right. There's a resonance with one aspect. And then another, quite clearly, you think, hmm, I think this was added on. Mm -hmm. Yes, things evolve and change. And uh, if people go back to my... Uh my podcast with Dolores Whelan, she talks about that too, about the, the how things changed, and of course the patriarchal slant, also the uh, eventually the, the Christianity. 
a lot of things, texts come from Christianity. So um, it's like what they say about some of the uh, the ancient myths and legends and the saints, of course, too. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting work there to to dive in and then really go within and find the real truth and meaning um, in that. And um, speaking of truth and meaning, of course, now in this year 2020, I mean, even even before 2020, we had so many things going on with uh, environmental concerns and uh, just the way that everybody was treating each other on the planet. Now we're ex faced with extraordinary challenges with the global pandemic, as well as you know things that are coming bubbling up to the surface that were there, but are being more. Uh, uh, there's more awareness around them, like racism and sexism and xenophobia. Um, so, and it's especially in North America, but it reverberates around the globe. So is there something about um, Celtic and Irish spirituality that can, um, and, and perhaps shamanism that can help as kind of a healing balm or something that can evoke some wisdom uh, hmm. during this time? For definitely for me, yes. Um, the the very premise of shamanism worldwide, but particularly with the Irish Celtic, which is the path that I follow, is inclusivity, mm. unconditional love, and it's a path of ecstasy. Now, interesting enough, that's a word a lot of people are not sure about, or even dare I say, a little bit fearful about. It doesn't mean that we're all running around happy out. It means that we we follow through the flow of the wounded healer to young to use Carl Jung's uh, wonderful expression to heal that what needs to be healed to come to a place of ecstatic joy and bliss when we unite with all that is Rumi the poet, he, he really spoke about this so wonderfully. And th there are those, as you know, formal religions, and it's very much about this is suffering on earth, and then when you die, you get the bliss bit. Mm. Shamanism, it, it, we are in the Garden of Eden. And again, when you think of the young folk, um, the Greta Thunbergs, but certainly in Ireland, the teenagers were up marching mm. saying, come on, people you need to look after this earth because we're going to inherit it and our children's children. So there's a very much a sense of coming back to basics. But, but Amy, with an evolution, we're, we're not about running around like our ancestors. We're, we're gleaning their wisdom, combining it with our modern life and evolving it forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important point because sometimes people think that we're all running around with pretending to be as our ancestors were years and years ago. Right. There, there's a blend. There, there's an, um, an emergence of the ways, shall we say, the, the traditions together. So for me, this path goes back to basics. When I'm listening on the radio to how many deaths from COVID-19, the, the xenophobia, the ageism, the sexism, and it's worldwide, mm. I, I get great solace from going outside into nature. I take it back to within me. So am I beating myself up? Am I judging myself as a woman? Am I not being inclusive of myself and what can i do about those thoughts so then when i come out into the world i i've gone back to the core and i've reshaped that and i'm in a much better position to talk to my neighbors from all ethnic backgrounds colors you get it yes that's beautiful and i think sometimes People think it's very surface thing. It's be nice to your black neighbors and it's be nice to treat the women just as much as you men. And that's that's very true. But sometimes we are most violent in our own heads to ourselves. 
So it has to go right back to the core at literally cellular level. And I think that's the depth of this path for me, that it goes deep, deep spirals within and without. Yes, that's exactly right. We forget this. The directions go in so many different ways and uh, we're in this sort of interconnected web. And also, um, yeah, I, I kind of sometimes there's a lot of action that happens in the external world. There's a lot of marching and that's, that's important, but it's often for me, it's, um, I think the most change can happen when I look within myself, as you say, go into nature, have time alone, be able to maybe work with a text and try to unravel some things that I've been holding on to or uh, stress that I'm holding on to or perceptions that I have about someone or something like that. Um, so, so that's where I think the really important work starts. And I think during this pandemic, during a time of this kind of social upheaval in a way that um, people feel a little bit like, well, what do I do? You know, I, I want to, I would love to contribute to help the world, but how do I do that? And uh, I think uh, the best way is to go within and see what, what, we can do and work on ourselves. So I think that's beautiful. You said a lot of wonderful things that brought up um, some really important points um, with the ecstasy, um, with the mystical mm -hmm. traditions that I think permeate as much as ecstasy sort of sounds like, oh, ecstasy, like what are we talking about here? But there's the spiritual ecstasy that even Christians um, write about and uh, Catholicism, whatever Christianity, mm -hmm really under that umbrella, you know, we're maybe yeah, we're talking about uh, St. Teresa or ones that um, saints and, and figures that have really um, had these ecstatic experiences. Um, it's been a part of history, even though uh, some kind of want to stamp it out or get afraid of it. But, you know, it's mm. almost like Kundalini awakening as well. Um, Absolutely. So... And, and also you were talking about the values of unconditional love um, and acceptance and um, uh, so, so many things and care for the earth that are part of the Celtic and Irish spirituality that, of course, are now evolving and becoming part of uh, uh, modern life. We have to, we're human beings and we change and we grow and our spirituality must change and grow and that's just natural you know it's just part of being human um with those archetypes you were talking about and um yeah it's all wrapped up you know um we use these stories to make sense of our our landscape as it as it is today you know that's how i i see it but um yeah that was beautiful i appreciate that um and then there's of course the element of pilgrimage that is so important. I mean, it's so many traditions, but especially the Celtic and Irish tradition. Um, and I think it could be very helpful. You're talking about going into nature and uh, the importance and the kind of wellspring that can bubble up for us. Um, and walking, of course, during this pandemic was allowed during this home, these homestay measures for the most part. Um, and now, of course, people can travel a bit more freely or, or widely in their countries, keeping their distance and, and all the regulations and all that. But is it possible for a pilgrimage then to help at this time, um, even if uh, people don't live near these uh, beautiful sacred sites in Ireland? Um, is it possible to connect to their local land for wisdom and meaning? Absolutely, Amy. Yes, very well said. Um, I, I think your listeners would know previous podcast with the great Dolores Whelan. And Dolores and I are, shall we say, co-rediscoverers of Bridget's Way Celtic Pilgrimage, which is a nine-day pilgrimage from St. Bridget's birthplace in Fogard and Loud, down past the Hill of Slain, the Hill of Tara, all the way down to the Curra. Uh, literally a straight line as the swan flies, as they say. <laughs> and it's a lesser known part of Ireland, very picturesque. And this has been going on since 2013. But I am amazed since, since Dolores and I 
who hardly knew each other the previous year, walked this together. It's attracted people from Canada, America, North and South, Australia, all over the Celtic Isles, Ireland, Europe. Unbelievable. And time and time again, there is that sense of just coming away, walking in the land, letting the wisdom of the land come up, the wisdom of the sky, the awakening. And one part of it, if we're really honest, is you're out of your comfort zone, you're away from home, you're not working, you have to, all you have to do all day is walk for five hours. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, we laugh. It's not Bridget's boot camp. We do have um, a volunteer car behind us so that if you really want to lift after lunch, you can have it. Mm. Sometimes that's part of the pilgrimage, accepting help. <laughs> and it's extraordinary that every step is a prayer. And we set an intention every day. So you're walking for yourself, you're walking for your loved ones, you're walking for your community, for your... So it, it can be for many different things. And the, the healing, the opening, the awakening, dare I say, the initiation has been absolutely phenomenal. However, this year we had to postpone our nine-day pilgrimage because of COVID-19. So we came up with something rather novel and we said, Okay, on the day we were due to start, let's everybody walk on their balcony, in their garden, in their park, within their two kilometer zone or whatever it is, wherever you live. And we will set an intention. We'll ask Bridget to provide protection, creativity, inspiration. Her so many, so many attributes, archetypal energy she offers us. Amy, we couldn't believe the reaction. It just went crazy. So we still, a woman, a lovely woman from, from Canada, uh, Kate, Kathleen Quinn and her husband Ash, since they've been walking every Saturday around their neighborhood since we did that. Wow. And they send us pictures and they said, it's opened up a whole new aspect of their lives and all of their neighbors know what they're doing. So. Pilgrimage is, by its very essence, um, sacred, active meditation, as opposed to passive when you're sitting in prayer or meditation. So this is active. And you're also reading the signs around you. Mm. What are the birds doing? What animals appear? What conversations do you have? But you can do this anywhere, literally in your back garden, on your balcony. Yes. I mean, obviously, when you come to Ireland, you're, you're tapping in to those deep archetypal energies of Bridget. And myself and Dolores are honoured to, to lead, to host certain days. Um, so if you did climb to Crowpatrick Mountain, you'd be tapping into Crom Cruach and also St. Patrick. But if you walked in the Rockies, if you walked in any of the First Nations sites, the similarly. Mm. But I think what's most important is, and this was highlighted to me through Bridget's Way, when we walk the Camino de Santiago, when we walk a known route, we are picking up on the energies that have been there before us, our ancestors. However, back in the day, somebody had to start that. So we can start in our homes in our gardens, in our parks. And if we, if we walk in pilgrimage long enough, others will come too. Yes. So again, there's that evolution, that's that flow forward with our intention. I think that's beautiful. And even rediscovering, yeah, rediscovering the local, just, just the land itself is, is wonderful. Tapping in also, it could be to, to the spirituality and uh, the traditions that are in the area. I uh, live in Quebec and there is a tradition of the Christian missionaries coming. And of course there's the problematic part of that as well, but uh, farmers, it's kind of like this pastoral um, tradition where 
farmers would put up a, a cross and sometimes that would alert people that a town was coming up or something like that or mark somebody's land but there's all these different ornate crosses if i just drive in my rural town and i go to the next town i might see two or three or four large crosses and they're all kind of different styles and different uh, materials and uh, during Lent because I thought that this 40-day period uh, is kind of a beautiful time at this kind of cross um, the, the, the gradient from the, the winter to the spring it's just a beautiful time so um, there's more to it than just the Christian Lent for me um, but I went almost every day to each um, cross and I took a photograph of it and things like that and it just helped me to connect to Quebec. I'm not from Quebec originally, but helped me to connect to the land that way. And just this kind of evidence of uh, human beings being here, maybe even, you know, decades or maybe centuries before me laying this down. Um, and it was a fun thing for me to do during uh, the pandemic as well. Because <laughs> people were saying it was the lentiest Lent they ever lented. <laughs> it was like, we wanted to give up one thing, but we didn't, didn't know we were going to give Everything. up too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But I, it was, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a special moment for me. But um, to come back to the Irish, um, when you mentioned Fahard, for some reason I just got these chills and kind of tears come to my eye. I just, I don't know, it just comes to me. It just, it just is what it is. But, you know, it, it was. Um, I went to Ireland about 12 years ago. And uh, 2008, 2009, we were about on the brink of a economic decline there, and uh, it hit Ireland eventually very, pretty hard. And you know, there was something that drew me to Ireland. And after I left, it's like Ireland kept calling to me. And I, then the next year, I wound up as a student at University of Limerick. <laughs> so, uh, in the uh, ethnomusicology program, which, by the way, folks. Um, that's an online program if people are interested in becoming an ethnomusicologist or ethnochoreologist or any other discipline there. But anyway, um, and it, it really pulled on my heartstrings to go back. Um, and when you're talking about the sacred sites in Ireland that you go to in, in Br Br Bridget's Way, what is it about these particular sacred sites that draw people to visit them? And what is it about Ireland? It feels like there's something in the land. There's some, are there ley lines? Is there a special constellation? Is there? Well, I think first, let me talk a little bit about the sacred sites. Are you familiar, and I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with the practice of acupuncture. So this is a Chinese tradition. And the principle is that the body has energy meridians going down. And every so often there's a node. Um, we're familiar with the Indian, the chakra system, and the seven key chakras. So the sacred sites were built on what are called ley lines, L-E-Y, often referred to as dragon lines, interesting enough. And the, again, feng shui um, from China, Vastu Veda from India, would speak of this. But in truth, every indigenous country culture would have had their version of it. So in, in Ireland, we would have had three, we didn't call them chakras, we called them doorways. Mm. And they were cauldrons. So the womb or the dantian for the men, the heart chakra, and the third eye. So these would have been the three portals, doorways. So similarly, the sacred sites were built on these meridian lines if you will nodes in the land so there was a concentration of energy there mm. and it's said that particularly around tara the boyne valley in Meath has so many new grange now doubts tara um that as above so below that they they were placed to mirror the stars the planets that's that's a theory it, it hasn't been proved but it's an interesting one so that would be why the sacred sites are so important. And then if we spiral on to why Ireland, I mean, what's extraordinary, Amy, is we're a tiny little island. There's, there's only five million of us here. We're a tiny little island off the west coast of Europe. 
And yet on the 17th of March, literally the world goes green. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. <laughs> so I think you could walk to any pub in the world and you'll get Guinness, Irish whiskey, and probably, what's that other drink? Irish cider. <laughs> Bailey's is the Right, one. yeah. So my theory, and it's a theory, is that, again, if we go back to those old books, one of the books is called Dichenkis, and it's the lore of places. So it talks about place names and why places get their names. But off the west coast of Ireland, as you look towards Newfoundland, there it was said that there was the island, the High Brazil, the land, um, Tirnanog, the land of the ever young, um, Tirnamio, the land of the ever living. So my theory is that the lost island of Atlantis, hmm. it would make sense that it's somewhere in the Atlantic. And we are surrounded on three sides by the Atlantic Ocean. So my pet theory is that the lost island of Atlantis is sunk somewhere off in the Atlantic and the nearest landmass is Ireland. So somehow we have managed to seep up the wisdom. So that's one. The second one is that because we were on the edge of Europe, we and we were neutral in the both world wars so we we weren't invaded by the romans we didn't have any of the world wars and um, we were remote um so there, there's a um a holding of the old ways for example yes catholicism christianity came but the holding of the monasticism in particular say the monks and the skelligs, uh, Bridget's community in Kildare, which was a mixed community, was very shamanic, very earthy. E even Patrick, I believe, I think that Patrick has been sanitized and for political reasons elevated. But if you, if you look back to the old stories, that they're very earthy, very otherworldly, very um, primal. So I, that, that for me would be fine. Oh yeah, and there's a final reason. At last, we Irish as a nation are beginning to own our shadow. Mm -hmm. Now for many years, with the Holy Catholic stamp and the Holy Catholic guilt, there was a saying we've often had, don't be telling people your business. So it was all very, um, I think you might talk in your, about white picket fences. We would talk about um, white lace curtains. Okay. And finally, as a people, we're admitting uh, religious abuse, yes. Um, were church and state involved? Yes. Uh, were we involved in the slave trade back in the day? Yes. Uh, did we, during the famine, was it cannibalism? More than likely, yes. Um, in the Civil War, did brother and sister and husband and wife fight each other? And yes. Our version of Nazi Germany is the the unbelievable um, abuse for uh, women who got pregnant. So even though it might have been incest or rape, the woman was punished, mm -hmm. not the men. And I think because we're owning the shadow and like, okay, we fess up, we did this, that somehow it's unblocked mm. the, the spirituality. It's like the beacon is, is going out into the world. And holding that all a secret, sanitizing it, kept it hidden, blocked. But now there's the, 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 yeah, the pressure cooker has been unleashed. Yes, that, uh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Uh, and it would be nice to kind of, uh, for that to be happening. It sounds like that's happening, but it's, that's a beautiful poetic way to put it, that perhaps the US and the Canada, are, they're owning, to their shadow uh, at this point as well, um, acknowledging some of the, uh, the things that have happened in residential schools and in the case of Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hear about this history now and some of this history I hadn't heard of before because, uh, you know, I'm American, uh, so I don't always hear the Canadian history. So there's that. And of course, the um, 
of everything that happened in U.S. history. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, that's very interesting that the, the shadow side part of it. Um, and um, I'm going back to the beginning of what you were talking about, you're talking about sort of these nodes, these energy centers. Uh, those three that you mentioned, um, would they correspond also with Eru and Fodla and Banba too? Do they connect? Um, yes and no. Um, for me, um, the, the three sisters, the Triskel, Eru, Banba and Fola, um, are the sovereignty goddesses. So Eru is the one out in the world. She has given her name, Eru, Era, Erin, Ireland. And Banda and Fola support her on scene. So to me, Banda earths the lower world, Eru is the middle world, and Fola is the upper world. Now you could say, yes, the you know the lower world is a place of power. So when we talk about the, the second chakra, that cauldron, the Dantien, the power, there's a power center. Now again, it's probably you'd associate that again more with the third chakra. So there, there's elements of it. Mm -hmm. The heart chakra, that unconditional love with protected, the upper world, the the subconscious, the authentic self, the higher self. So yeah, there there is, um, there's definitely an analogy, but I would see it more in the different levels of the other world within the Celtic Irish tradition. Okay, that's really, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I, I like that in our course, we were talking about sovereignty and so much can be, I think, gleaned um, at this time about um, the sovereignty, uh, sovereignty in so many aspects. Um, are you able to talk a little bit more about sovereignty? Sovereignty? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I think today in our modern vernacular, we would probably equate sovereignty with empowerment. Sovereignty is um, it's a slightly older word and it's often associated with um, kingship, queenship, majesty, uh, regal. So that, that has a different connotation now. Whereas if you're in your sovereign power, if you were empowered, then you were a full woman, then you were um, an authentic man, you were uniting, you were mature. Yes. And Eru, as a sovereign power, she is the embodiment of the Irish nation. Most countries are known as the motherland. An exception, Germany would be the fatherland, but most countries would be known as the motherland, and that would come from Mother Earth. So that would be Danu to us, it would be maybe Turtle Island to you, or dependent Pachamama, there's different Gaia. Mm. And When you're in your sovereign power, you are not coming from a place of ego. You are coming from a place of heart, but you're also not a walkover. You're not passive. There is um, an honesty, uh, a reading the world. There is a humility, but there is a, I know who I am, as much as we can do as humans. So it's, it's a beautiful mix. One of the key tenets of the Irish Celtic traditions is paradox. So holding two opposites at the same time. And I suppose in our modern world, we know it with the love-hate. So you can absolutely love your teenager one minute, and the next minute you could be ready to strangle them because they've done something crazy. Mm. You might have been in the throes of passion with your partner, and 10 minutes later, <laughs> so the, the paradox, the, the, the duality that becomes one, and that's that union, that bliss that we go back to. So um, if you're in your sovereign power, if you're empowered, then you can hold that, the two concepts together. Yes. Whereas if you are not if you're narcissistic if you're immature if you're depending on others helpless hopeless it's very hard to do that mm -hmm. yes exactly 
um, and I'm thinking sort of the political sphere, spheres also. But almost, but yeah, that, that's very interesting uh, to talk about, and I think that that brings a lot of meaning to um, just. I think there's that's the nature of human beings. Is we have two uh, hemispheres of the brain. <laughs> there are so many different. Uh, we have twos. And ooh, I think we're always trying to seek that oneness, that ecstasy, that flow state, uh, coherence, if you will. So it's, it's beautiful. Um, so let's see where I am. Um, so this is the Celtic Feminine podcast, of course. And we talk about the feminine within Celtic and Irish spirituality. Um, so, of course, we cannot discuss the feminine within Irish spirituality without discussing Bridget. So if you could give a quick elevator speech about who Bridget is, what would you say? Bridget is the bringer of spring. So she's an Irish Celtic goddess, pre-Celtic, and she heralds the activity of springtime after the hibernation of the winter time which is the Kalyuk, the Crohn's domain. So Bridget brings in dawn. She brings in birth, inspiration. She is the one that harnesses the creativity of dreaming and manifests it into action. She was incarnate as Saint Bridget. And this would have been in 450, some say 452 AD. She was around until 520 AD. And again, these are dates that we're, we're working with, but it would have been around that, those particular centuries. And by all accounts, she was born of a chieftain father and his, basically his slave woman. So Duftek was the chief, Brunshuk was the slave woman, a bonds woman it was known as. Mm -hmm. and from the stories we know, she was an extraordinary child, loved by everyone, but particularly connected with nature. So very shamanic. And oh, there's wonderful myths and legends where Bridget decides in her power that she's going to have a spiritual life and her parents are, ah, no, 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 it'll be time to marry soon. You're 13 now. No, no, no. And she found in all the stories about her, she always found a way to get what she wanted, but never, never at the um, disadvantage of the other person. In other words, her parents said, yes, you can have your path. The chieftain said, yes, you can have this fertile land of there. So she teaches us so much about our lives today, how to find a way, there's always a way. And she embodies a woman in her power, She's feisty. She's practical. And her community in Kildare was a mixed community. Mm -hmm. And with Cuthbert, who became St. Cuthbert, so he, was, he was over the lads. She was over the, the women. Mm -hmm. And she tended a, a fire temple. So this would have had harked back to, say, Athena and the goddesses um, in the Delphi oracles in, in Greek, back in Roman times, those fire temples. Yes. her holy sacred water and her crosses her iconic read equilateral crosses were for protection mm -hmm. um so that she's a saint of so many midwives babies poets um smith craft nurses i mean you name it bridget's there but her 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 archetypal energy is stand up for what you believe in she, protection and pr not just protection of your house and your home but s protection as in mother tiger energy don't mess with mine this is me and my power she is quintessentially the feisty irish woman and <laughs> yeah and when bridget walks with you or when you walk with bridget you know it. You really know it. <laughs> oh, that was a long elevator journey. 
<laughs> we have a lot of those around here. <laughs> we had one where we, we went off about uh, Hildegard one time, so that was... <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, I feel like they're kindred, right? <laughs> Hildegard and Bridget. <laughs> um, for you, it, does Bridget hold a special spiritual significance? Yes, it's very interesting. As a child, we all learned about Bridget in school and on the 1st of February, uh, in bulk or, or in the belly, mm. uh, the first day of spring here, we would celebrate her. We'd all weave the crosses, we'd tell her stories. And it wasn't really until I was, I, I think I was in my early 30s, I, I was at that stage on the holistic path that I began to realise, gosh, you know, my granny, my great granny was from there. And I thought, oh yeah. So again, it was in the back of my mind, but it, it was when I was doing my, the, the first formal shamanic course I did, I mentioned the four ways. And this wonderful colleague, Catherine McGuire, uh, we were doing an architect class and we were all invited to present something on an architect. So Catherine rocked up in her wedding dress and beautiful Celtic cloak. And she was going to present something. And what was really interesting was the teacher said to me, Oh, Karen, I hear you're doing, you're going to be Bridget. And I went, What? And she said, Aren't you going to present Bridget? God is Bridget. And I went, like, I went, no. But I also went, who? <laughs> so it was Catherine. And I'll never forget, she stood up in her cloak and and she looked me in the eye, and Bridget looked out and it went. Boom. I, it was like I'd been. Bing. I I was Cupid's arrow. I was, oh my god! Something woke within me, and I mean the synchronicities are incredible. My my great grandmother and grandfather lived literally in the shadow of Bridges Fire Temple. Wow! My grandmother grew up there. My mother visited as a child. There there is um um. A, a Celtic round tower, a tower that the, the monks would have used in Kildare beside the fire temple. And in Dublin, who knew there's a Bridget's well in Dublin and there's one of those towers too. So wow. the well is seen as the womb and the tower is the male, the phallic. And my grandfather came from Clondalkin and my grandmother from Kildare. So there's both. Wow. I mean, uh, it, it, there's so yeah. many coincidences, really. So many uh, Last night I was I was on the Moon Mana, um This is the women's group, the women's side of Chambri, and I was doing. Um, I, I do a little ancient Irish wisdom for modern women series, and last night was bird divination. So how to the the art of reading signs with the birds, and twice I wrote down the word bird as breed. And I realized, <laughs> oh, my God. Breed is the Gaelic for Bridget. I, yeah. I, I got a shock, actually. And, of <laughs> course, her totem animals are the swan Yeah, is, is a key Bridget totem, which, again, would be, um, I would have a great affinity for. So, and I've no doubt I'll spend the rest of my life looking at all of these wonderful synchronicities. Yeah. Oh, that's really beautiful. Do you think Bridget has any special wisdom or messages for us in our current time, whether it's sovereignty or women's empowerment or even uh, 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 well, uh, <laughs> environmental justice? Or Well, I have no doubt Bridget would have been wearing a mask. <laughs> and I've no doubt Bridget would have been brewing, uh, making hand sanitizer, and she would have protected her communities. But she would also have found a way to look after, she, she would have been at the heart of the amazing online hospital staff, the nurses, the carers, the doctors that are treating those with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. My sense, of her, her, her archetypal energy, it's very no-nonsense, it's practical, it's, it's not airy-fairy or fluffy, it's, this needs to be done, let's roll up our sleeves and do it. Um, I mean, this is a saint who brewed beer. I mean, how amazing is that? <laughs> yes, go on, Richard. <laughs> so, um, 
she she held that duality she was busy and practical but yet there was the she tended the fire on the 19th on the 20th night so she 19 women tended it and she tended it on the last so the quiet time the going within have you ever seen and i'm sure some many of your listeners have seen an irish an iron jumper hmm. yes okay. i have <laughs> so an iron jumper has these fabulous fancy and tricked blackberry stitch or uh, moss stitch and then it has a plain panel and then it has a fancy and a plain and a fancy and that's the way we need to be in life that's the way bridget would speak to me busy quiet busy quiet busy quiet we need the the flow and the ebb we can't have the all busy and we can't be all quiet we need both that's right uh, it reminds me of music the theme and variations you know there you go so well since i mentioned that um I know there's a connection with, uh, and this is what I've studied too, uh, with uh, music and Bridget. Um, so many people are inspired to write songs dedicated to her and are part of uh, whether they're small rituals or for their own personal use or for a large event like the Solace Breed, um, Fela Breed uh, Bridget's Eve celebration. Um, are, are there any songs that you often use? in your own uh, ritual work oh yeah well we we i mean elaine elaine ecardi you yes. mentioned earlier on elaine has written stunning bridget songs and the wonderful Gemma mcgowan again she would have um deirdre nicaneda arrives and and also uh some of your your listeners might know christy moore the irish balladeer but his brother yeah um barra um he has written this fabulous Bridget song, and they arrive every Imbolc Eve, the 31st of January, for the amazing Solace Breed of Sisters to sing these songs. For the people come from all over the world. Um, we, the Moon Mana, Moon Women, we have the Bridget's fire blessing, and in her fire temple, this blessing came to me. I mean, it's funny. People say, where, where did the moon and all, where did these rites of passage come from? So I am very privileged that the Bridget's inspiration has come, come down, come up through me to, to bring to a modern evolution these ancient ways. So we chants come through. But what's lovely is with Bridget's theme, it's the gorgeous. Bridget, shine your light for us, show us the way. So it's a real tradition of Bridget's air, uh, whereas for so many of the other themes, um, an original theme comes through. But this was about honoring what already is. Yes, that's lovely. Is that a an, uh, an Irish tune already, the Bridget Light, light a Path for us? Yeah, I, I actually don't know where it came from. I know uh, Deirdre sings it. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget, shine your light for show us the way. In the dark of night, in the bright of day, Bridge, you shine your light from us, show us the way. Um, yeah. I don't know its origins. I don't know. Um, I, I try to find out, like, dig a little bit more, but um, so many of these wonderful chants you, you hear, but you don't know necessarily where they came from. Exactly. Um, but, but say within the Moon Manal women's, Celtic women's circles, every theme every month has a chant. And I, I train women to be movement of facilitators uh, from all around the world online. And sometimes someone will say, well, I'm not a singer, so I, I won't do the chance. And I'm going, try it once. <laughs> so have your phone handy, play the chant. I'll say the words, then I'll sing it. And then we have examples of all the chants on the phone. And I said, somebody in the group will pick it up. So just because you're not a singer doesn't mean the other women. Oh, Amy, when you hear women's voices joining in unison. Now, men's voices joining in unison are fantastic. Men and women joining, children's older, fabulous. But there's something like this, the, the, the chorus of voices, the, the energy behind it, that's very, very special. Yes. It, it feminine. Really is. Yes, very much so. Divine feminine. Um, there are a lot of uh, the, the symbolism and uh, 
with the, the with Bridget and how she is a, a woman for poets and musicians. And there's mm -hmm. so much of that in her uh, mythology. But uh, you were talking about the Moon Mana groups. And for years, mm -hmm. I've been seeing you guys, you ladies, on Facebook. <laughs> and I didn't realize you were behind it. So, <laughs> so it, it was wonderful. Um, can you tell us more about this group and, and what it's all about? And, and yeah, I, I, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be delighted to. Um, I explained earlier on that myself and John, uh, my partner, my husband, we have been following the, the shamanic path. Shli on Cree, the Path of the Heart, is our school and clinic. And <laughs> I remember so well, it was 2009, and John said, oh, I, I, I think I'll set up a men's group. And I'm going, oh, that's a good idea. Yes, yes, I, I think it'd be really important to have a men's group. So he wrote this really fancy, long, beautiful document, and he sent it out, and um, seven men came back and said, yes, we'd love to be part of this. And I kind of went, oh, my gosh, I suppose I should, I should set up Maybe I should ask the women. I sent out literally a two line email. I could not believe the response. <laughs> there was hundreds of them. I'm like, oh my gosh. So around that time I was I was on the hill of Tara and they built a motorway. Um and they're not on the hill itself, but the 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 environs around it would have been part of the great Tara. Mm back in the day and the motorway was going to dissect Rath Lu, uh, so Rath, um, a sacred mound mm. and we all went the night before they brought the diggers in having, having protested for a long time and there was I will never forget it this massive setting sun like this ball of red on one side of the sky and this huge super moon full moon on the other and it was the divine masculine, the divine feminine held. And the inspiration came through from Bridget to hold women's circles. Mm. And I thought, oh, on the Hill of Tara. How would I do that in the winter, Irish winter? And it, it just kept niggling away. So this email came about. I said, okay, let's come together. And it just literally snowballed. So back in the day, it began as uh, we'd all join together. We would open sacred space. We'd hand cast our circle and we'd chat. And then I began to ask the women what they wanted. So the, the rites of passage, the themes literally made themselves known. So now we have, uh, there's many, many different themes, but the classics are Grania the Maiden. So our first moon time. Danu, the mother, uh, the Ancalyak, the crone, a really important one is Sheila Nagy, sacred sexuality, the fairy rites, hmm. Bridget's fire blessing, and, and there's so many more, but we're, 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 we honor our breasts, our wounds, our, um, our sovereignty with Eru. And sometimes I'm asked, oh, is that not a bit um inclusive only of women and exclusive of men but it's taken as a given that the men folk are doing their own thing and then we all come back together that's the key bit mm. so if i am with my women folk and if i'm exploring my sexuality my physical feminine body who i am my ways of thinking of being then i come back to my partner who happens to be a male in a better way so that there can be a cohesive community mm -hmm. a peaceful community yes and, and i think the men's shed movement is fantastic i think that's a, a kind of a very in um how would you say uh, a non-formal an informal way of having a men's circle and what is that about the i like that term i that's the first time i've oh. So a men's shed, um, it, it began in Australia, mm -hmm. and it's men in a shed 
uh, they could be doing some carpentry, they could be working on a boat, a motorbike, a cycle, they could be gardening. And in the doing, they begin to talk. And now there's women's sheds. And it's just gone right around the world. So they're, they're quite big in Ireland. It's a movement, men's sheds, it's called. That is cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. So do, you said you meet, now do you meet online? Um, yes. So, so for many years, for three years, I held a circle in Smithfield here in Dublin, where mm -hmm. I'm from. And then the women who attended said, look, we'd love to be able to host circles. So I began to teach women the movement of facilitators. So I did that for three years in Dublin. And then the word spread and women from all around the world said, oh, we'd love to do it, but I'm not in Dublin. So I took it online and it has just taken off like a rocket. So I suppose your, your listeners might be familiar with the red tent movement. Yes. Or the wonderful Miranda Gray in England, her womb mother. Mm -hmm. So if you like, this is the Irish Celtic version. Yeah. Uh, and it means moon women. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now you have Shulian Kri, you have Moomina circles. Um, what, what other authorings do you have um, for people or anything else that you'd let, love to share about that you, you offer people um, in your work? by way of wisdom or uh, courses or ah. maybe more about your shamanism well, um, offerings or seems like you do quite me, a, I, quite I do, things. I mean, at, at a very basic level, every day we, we post, as you said, on Facebook and Instagram and all things related to women. Uh, so it could be highlighting an amazing woman in, you know, Asia Mongolia and look what she's done, or it could be, um, something empowering or it could be a funny song it could be anything um we we have our our annual movement oh. diary journal and it's it's written for the northern hemisphere mm -hmm. and it is just a mine of information but every day you write in your your doodle or your draw your diary but there's loads of this crafting there's stories there's a theme for every year so that's one thing I love that. Um, on Sunday, I launch our Sacred Ireland Celtic Moon Oracle Cards, Ooh. which is very exciting. Ooh. So that's coming out. Um, John and I, um, I co-edited and produced the Soul Seers book. Mm. So this is 13 people, men and women, who express in creativity, creatively their shamanic journey. The Irish Celtic shamanic journey, poetry, prose, story, song lyrics, even, which is is great. And then I do a lunar gathering online every month. The next one is the third of August, and the theme is reveal your inner goddess. Ooh, yeah, that sounds this, beautiful. Yeah, this month just gone, it was uh, the fairy rites, mm -hmm. and the month before it was the mother rites of Danu. And September will be the Sheila Nagig rites, Ooh. sacred sexuality. Ooh. Wow. Um, so so the, the, the Facebook posts and the Instagram are free. The Ancient Irish Wisdom for Modern Women that I mentioned, the bird divination, that, that's free. I do that Facebook on live. And then the, the Lunar Gatherings and the goddess, Irish goddess, Queen of the Year. So like they're, one is 15 euro. Um, the self ceremonies are 15 euro, the goddess wheel of the year is 40 euro, and then the, the actual to train to be a facilitator with me is a 13 month long journey, oh. and that's 90 euro a month. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's very in depth training. Um, wow, it's a very special journey. Yeah, it's all on our website. That's Moon amazing. Uh, is the maybe you mentioned it before, but is the training coming up soon? Well, the, the beauty of it is you, you can start any time. Um, uh -huh. it, it's designed to to come in any time you want. The interesting thing is, <laughs> um, the next intake will be 
August. Mm -hmm. And the first theme, the first module is, we call it the foundation theme. So that's, that's the basics, the building blocks, the stones that the course is based on. And then in, so you get that in September. And then in October, your first theme is the energetic cauldron of your womb. So that spirals back to what we were talking about earlier on. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very special course. And what's lovely is that the, the women who are on it from around the world, they bring their own skill sets. So some are sound healers, some are yoga teachers, some are teach meditation, some are homemakers mm-hmm. or herbalists. It, it can be whatever skill set you bring yeah. comes through and it's your unique voice. But I, I love that the course is set up that it pays for itself. So within the foundation theme, you hold an introductory circle with three women, mm-hmm. your, you know, your neighbor, your friend, your sister. And then the next month you hold your circle and there's an energy exchange. So that pays for your 90 euro. So it, it pays for itself. And wow. I think, you know, we're women. We're practical. Again, this is Bridget coming through. <laughs> there needs to be a way for us to be able to to do these things, to to learn, to connect in in ways that are are very doable. That's right. Yes, we need doable, especially in these mm. days. You know. So, wow. Thank you. You. Yeah. You have such a depth to your work that uh, can can hit. People uh, wherever they are, you know, mm-hmm. I think that's really, really beautiful. So, if listeners wanted to learn more about your offerings um, and contact you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so our, our website, uh, www.moonmana, so that's M O O N M N A dot I E, and Mana is the Gaelic word for women, so it's yes. moon women, mm-hmm. and they can sign up for our newsletter and Amy it's regular but it's not too regular we're not going to you know send you something every single day it's going to be um for example it could be last night it was about the ancient Irish wisdom for modern women and next week it'll be to mind women where to get the cards and when the lunar gathering is on that type of thing ah. um so it's really it's really all in that and there's a contact me page at the end so if anybody wants to send me an email that way but so far women have found it all fairly self-explanatory which is great yeah um, and, and that's marvelous yeah well oh, that's beautiful beautiful work um and thank you so much for being here today is there anything you wanted to mention or anything that anything on your mind <laughs> well i think i think here we are two women you can Feminine, me, Moon Mana, Pathway of the Heart, Shleon Cree. And I'm sure that there's women who maybe follow us who might think we have a charmed existence mm-hmm. and that we have all these amazing attributes. So uh, well, it's, it's all well for her doing that. And I suppose I'd like to say I'm an ordinary woman. Do I have nervous excitement before I do something new? Absolutely. Was I nervously excited before I came on here? Yes. Um, do I quiet myself down to listen to my, my open but protected heart and hear the wisdom that's available to me from the land, from all that is, and, and to do be the best that I can be? Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. I'm human. But I think... It's never been so important that we women stand up equal but different to our men folk. And for some of us in, you know, a white Western modern world, that's easy. And for some of us around the world, that's really, really hard. But at least if we take that empowered, that sovereign step, there will be a ripple right around the planet. And I'm 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 a bit geek. I'm a I'm a uh, Game of Thrones, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Harry Potter fan. Myths and legends really speak to me, and always 
somebody had to stick their neck out and try and then boom there was a flow and i often think of that a beautiful scene in the second book of um the lord of the rings where the humans were realizing oh my gosh this helps us as hopeless we'll never do it and next minute so they had the elven people and then they had the the um you know the the dwarves they had the trees they had and then the ancestors came in and all of them combined prevailed and won the day mm. yeah so that there is so much help out there for us not just our fellow man and men and women but the our pets our plants the animals the unseen and if we can open up to that then we will live in a very very beautiful planet Yes, I'd say so. That the beautiful words. I really appreciate that. You know, when you're talking about Bridget before and just her practical nature and her uh, just no nonsense. Uh, and you were talking about the uh, the shows and the movies. Um, have you seen Outlander? Oh, I love Outlander. You know, <laughs> the main character, uh, Katrina Balfe, is Irish. An amazing yes. actor. Yes. Do you happen to know her? <laughs> Uh, no, I've never met Katrina yet. She, interesting enough, she she was discovered by the Ford Model Agency in Dublin when she was a student. Mm -hmm. I think she was only about eighteen, yeah. and they whisked her off. Um, so she was she was a top model, um, catwalk model for about ten years, wow. honing her craft in the background. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she she has lived away from Ireland more than she's actually lived in Ireland. She's yeah. from the north, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to meet her. She sounds great. She, yeah, uh, her character in Outlander oh, is fabulous. just when you said no nonsense. She's rolling up her sleeves, helping out with the pandemic. That's definitely Claire Fraser, you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Such Absolutely. A, when I saw that, the, just the first few moments of that show, I'm like, this is the the best show ever because of you know the stone circle and you have this very strong female character and. Yeah, there's so much of Bridget in her, actually, now that I think Absolutely. about it. But Absolutely. So and what, what I really like about uh, Claire and Jamie is that he has a very soft feminine side that you see, yes. and she has a very feisty, active male side. Yeah. And, and I love the way they, they, that interweaves between the two of them. And then, of course, you see it with, with her daughter, with Brianna, and, and you know, in her relationship, there's... there's a, a similar weaving which yeah. is great yeah definitely great ah uh, it's uh can't wait until the next season comes out if that's even mm. possible this time but yes it, it was a fantastic fantastic show but thank you so much for coming on today i really appreciate it and um, you have a beautiful friday